Hi friends! Welcome to Growing as Grown Ups, where we believe each of us has the opportunity to keep growing in ways that can fundamentally improve our life effectiveness, our leadership influence, and our well-being. Through interviews, stories, and practical principles, we explore how you can accelerate your growth and unlock your potential to make the difference you want to make. And now, your hosts from The Leaders Lyceum, Dr. Sarah Musgrove and Dr. Keith Eigel. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Growing as Grown Ups podcast. Today we are bringing you another episode in the Vertical Development series. And Keith, you are going to inter- introduce us to a longtime mm-hmm. colleague, friend, mentor of yours, Dr. Nancy Pop, who has been on this journey with you for 25 years. For a long time. So mm-hmm. who is Nancy? Tell us about her. So Dr. Nancy Pop. Uh, lives up in Boston, Massachusetts now. Uh, got her doctorate from Harvard uh, under Bob Keegan, which was a pretty cool person to study under. Mm-hmm. Um, now works for the Halgren Coaching Group um, and a group out of Amsterdam. And with Zoom, she's able to sort of coach and consult and train coaches all over the world. I think the coolest thing about Nancy is actually that she is a... Um, She's a, she's a developmental psychologist. She actually got her PhD in developmental psychology. Um, but she is probably one of the most skilled practitioners of the subject object interview method, which is how we assess leader levels, right? It's how we assess vertical development, probably the most reliable way. And Nancy helped me score 40 interviews for my dissertation and was just made the whole thing a blast. I talk a little bit about it in there, but she is um, just an amazing person, such a great teacher, such a great researcher, such a great practitioner, and she just brings all of that to bear during this during this episode. Yeah, so you gave me a hard time in my episode with um, Ryan Gottfriedson that we were geeking out. Yeah, and, got a little and, geeky. And you it? guys geek out a little bit, so this is kind of a more academically bent um, conversation, but I think there's so much to be learned. And for those of you that have been exposed to our model of leader levels and vertical development, this is a way it's, I mean, it's like sitting in a college developmental psychology class with you and Nancy. And so um, just for our listeners to get in the headspace, there's so much to learn. There's so much kind of thought leadership going on in this conversation, but it's going to help paint a picture of the vertical development journey in language different than the way we've explained it so far, which is really fun. Yeah, it is fun. And Nancy brings a lot of examples to bear and little metaphorical stories and ways that she thinks about it. We can talk more after the episode's yeah. over, but um, we've got a really sophisticated audience. So I think they have got this thing in their side pocket and a couple of geeky vertical development episodes is not going to hurt anybody no. too badly. So no. let's let's go to it. All right. So Dr. Nancy Pop, welcome to the Growing as Grown Up podcast. Um, I am so excited to have you with us and in, in our audience today. Well, thank you, Keith. It's great to be here. <laughs> Do you know, um, uh, this is one that uh, I, I told Sarah, I, I was, I'm so looking forward to the audience getting to know you because of the impact that you had in, in my mm-hmm. life, really. Um, as I kind of got moved by Bob Keegan's theory of the evolving self and 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 it, and it sort of redirected my research and my focus. Yeah. Um, Nancy had trained under Bob and um, and became an expert in the interview process where we assess developmental level. And in my dissertation, I had to set it off to the side. Did I ever send you a copy of this, by the way? I think you did, yes. Yeah, so... So I want to thank Dr. Nancy Pop, whose dialogues about subject object theory and unbridled bantering (laughs) about various interviews truly brought the intricacies of this theory to life and also provided a lot of fun during the crunch days. So it was fun to go back and sort of, I was looking, I was trying to look something up and I was like, well, there, there it is. I was, I was overt about it. So Yes, those meaningful were now conversations. Meaningful now, meaningful then. Mm-hmm. Um, f- folks, uh, uh, N- Nancy is, I think, probably, I mean, how hyperbolic does it sound to say in the world, but it may be in the world one of the premier experts in and in, in how do we understand and how do we 
measure what what our audience understands as vertical development. Uh, we use that as kind of a short, you know, it, it's it's the how do we measure constructive developmental stages? Mm -hmm. um, I and and you use the word subject object theory, and and S SO kind of a lot. So feel free to use your vocabulary, and the audience will um, will will catch on. But but just in general, I know that you have lunch conversations like I do. You have conversations with people that are like, "What do you do?" And when you try and explain to someone in quick layman's terms, what are some of the, what's some of the vocabulary that you use? Like, how do you think about it when you've got to explain, you know, adult development in, in this way? What, how yeah, does that, how's yeah. that? Well, it depends a lot on who the audience is, of course, but, but generally, you know, I talk about sort of the the central kind of um well i use the term center of gravity but that that it it's kind of it's kind of what what the person's life coalesces around so for like um stage two which what what do i call that um concrete instrumental yeah um it's more about you know the 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 concrete consequences of what I do you know and can I get what I want do I not get what I want you know it's either or very dualistic um and then for the um there's so many I, I know labels I'm sorry, we for use these the, things <laughs> I know so whether you call it social or or interpersonal yeah, I, with... yeah socializing interpersonal um I I in in the writing that I did with a colleague when I was working at Antioch, we called it affiliative because it was all about your affiliations. But somehow, I mean, I love that term, but it, it with all of the millions of, of labels that there are out there for these stages, I just, I stopped using it because I felt like it was just getting too confusing. So, um, but I do like that. But, but that in that stage or level or mindset, I actually prefer mindset. Um, the person's world kind of coalesces around, I call it the sphere of relationships. It's like that person is held within a sphere of important relationships, whether it's, you know, family, um, political party, church affiliation, job, relationship, whatever, that their whole, um, that they know themselves within this kind of sphere of that relationship. And so they don't know anything, they don't know themselves outside of that. So it's really held within this sphere, which, you know, the way that, that Keegan talks about this is I am my relationships. And so yeah. that those relationships hold me as a, you know, so it, it's like I'm held within this sphere. Those um, relationships, those affiliations. Yeah. They are that will you go one step further because I love this idea of center of gravity. Mm -hmm. When you think of center of gravity, how do you how do you use that? How do you use that term? Well, I have I'm a very visual person, so I get these images in my head. And so when I say center of gravity, what I think of is, you know, those those uh toys that kids have that, you know, they're like a inflatable toy that has like sand or something in the bottom that keeps it weighted so you can punch it and it'll you know wobble around but then it kind of you know <laughs> it stays it'll come back to balance it's such a great image <laughs> so you know it's like that it's sort of like you know what where where is your source of strength where is your groundedness you know and yeah. so so for for um for someone in the the interpersonal stage it re, it's those it's it's harmonious relationships you know mutuality and loyalty um and that's what keeps them balanced so you know i could go off on a whole riff on you know why why you know rifts or breakups or disagreements can make them feel so unbalanced but i'll 
then I would get way off track. <laughs> even, even saying that gave people a whole bunch of sort of heart palpitations. So that was yeah. good. <laughs> um, but then, you know, to continue sort of the, the, the um, self-authoring, you know, that kind of center of gravity is, is my own sense of self. You know, it's sort of like I have, you know, I determine inside of me what my values are, what my, um, you know, we also use the word internal compass. You know, I, I know what is important to me. I know what is right and what is wrong for me. So it's very, you know, whereas the, the interpersonal, you know, help being held within that sphere, it's, I need somebody else to tell me, you know, I need my, 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 my people to tell me what's right and wrong. I mean, oh, there's so many caveats. <laughs> I'm trying to just stay, you know, sort of on a higher level. Um, but, you know, the self-authoring is all, it's what this name sounds like. It's I author my own self. And so that center of gravity is, does this, you know, am I right with myself? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you go to the, the uh, self-transforming, stage five. I think, you know, I don't know if center of gravity, I, I, I'm not sure that that really applies because I think of that, you know, sort of my, my visual metaphor for that is like, water you know it maintains its its essential waterness but at full five you know on a full inter-individual self-transforming stage it kind of there is there's no attachment to me you know it's 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 uh one of the ways that i describe it is you know i know myself in context in process you know, so that, but there is an essential kind of meanness that, you know, like I'm still Nancy. Um, I'm not saying I'm stage five, believe me. <laughs> um, but there's a way that, that I am not, I'm not defined by any particular way of being or thought. So Bill Torbert calls it triple loop learning, which is I mean, to have that in context, there's single loop learning that if you, you know, if, if what you want to do isn't working, you go back and you change your behavior and you try something different. In double loop learning, you sort of think about, um, you know, the, the process, like maybe, um, you know, my, my strategy, maybe my strategy is not working. And so I'll change my strategy to get what I want. In triple loop learning, you actually change the whole idea of what you're going about. So it's it's like taking, you know, you're reflecting in the moment, is this working? And if it's not, maybe, maybe the way that I'm actually thinking about it is a little off and I need to actually change the way that I'm thinking. So it's that kind of level of kind of being, you know, really, uh, sort of in the moment and seeing seeing in the moment as you're constructing things, you know, like recognizing that I can choose to say this thing and it will take us over in this direction, or I could change this and it will take us over in that direction. You know, and it's, it's all about these choices that we face all of the time and how the choices we make create our reality. Yeah, oh, that's a beautiful, that's a, I, I love that. And you can almost in that last few sentences you said, imagine the wisdom that is often experienced by others is there a groundedness is there a center of gravity at level five sort of in 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 a value system or an outcome or do you not do you not see it that way well i don't see it that way um you know and i'm i'm describing like a full stage five right you know right. and there's not very many people who are there but the transition from, from self-authoring to self-transforming in the four to five journey, um, you know, there's still the four-ishness that's, that's going along with the five-ishness as you're transforming. So in that, then I think there is some sort of 
goal directedness and and a center of gravity in some value but and you know i mean i'm speaking like theoretically because i'm not full five so i don't know <laughs> you know is there a an historical example for you of someone who you felt like might have been in that category like a gandhi esque well, kind of person or a yeah i mean you know gandhi's the obvious kind of um image I don't know I really don't know because I think you know that it's it's such an abstract thing to try to understand sure and I have seen you know I've been doing this work for 35 years and I have I have read so many SOIs I mean <laughs> I like to say I've read more SOIs than God. And so, but, for, you know, for the audience, SOI is subject object, object interview, object which interview. is the way we measure the levels. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and I have seen in you know all of these thousands of interviews that I have read that you can you can have you, uh, you can be self-authoring and have a very kind of expansive worldview you know, and a value system that is, you know, everyone counts, you know, it's important to include everyone. Um, you know, it's, it's like this very expansive value system, but it's, it's still a value system to which I am loyal, or uh, which I will defend. So, so, so someone talking at five, at four can sound very five-ish, you know, because of the openness, because of the expansiveness, because of the inclusiveness, you know, and they, they may be a very spiritual person as well. But just that doesn't mean that they, that the ways that they are constructing their reality is at this inter individual or, or self transforming level. Um, hmm. Because I'm at that place. I'm still kind of identified with my own value system and I will defend that value system. Um, and, and so, and my goal in life is to promote, you know, well-being in the ways that I think are best. Mm -hmm. So my understanding of the self-transforming of stage five, you know, fully transforming is that I am not attached or defined by my value system. I recognize how I'm constructing it, but my, my sense of self doesn't depend on defending that or, um, mm -hmm. you know, or, or trying to, I mean, I can, I can take, I can take up a cause and I can work towards that cause but I am not, I'm, I'm not invested in it for my own sense of self. Yeah. Is, um, will you talk a little bit, because this is one of the things that we have maybe touched on a little bit in previous uh, podcasts, mm -hmm. um, the idea of subject and object. And, and the reason that I'm asking that, I know that you'll be able to talk about this, I, I think fairly quickly, but the, mm -hmm. But is there, a, is there a subject at five, the way you're thinking about it? Or is that part of what makes a fully self-transformed? Again, I don't think I've met anybody. I don't think, I know I haven't ever interviewed anybody, but I don't even think I've met anybody that I would say is pure five without some yeah. fourness still hanging mm -hmm. on. So, mm -hmm. so it may almost be a theoretical place on the journey more than an actual place, but yeah, I wonder. I don't know. I mean, I have never interviewed. I have interviewed people that you know in the middle of that transition, but never. So about the subject and object, I think what people are subject to is what we call the process. You know, because that's what's important is 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 the the process of it. And um, is there a different process at two, three, four, and five? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when I talk about, yeah, the process is what I was saying before about like the triple loop learning. Yeah. Where I'm, I'm, I'm aware 
that I am constructing my reality as I am doing it. So it's that awareness and the, the experience of it. So, you know, so at someone at, at a full self-authoring um, in, in that mindset, I know that I construct my reality because, you know, I understand this theory and blah, blah, blah. So I know that I am constructing things the way that I do. Okay. But that, but it's a kind of intellectual understanding. It's not an, a moment by moment experience. I don't experience myself constructing my sense of self while I'm doing it. And so, then object, and then contrast that to object. Well, the object is what I can take a perspective on. Yeah. So you know, at um, for the interpersonal stage. You know, I can, what is object for me are my, my impulses and my uh, wants and, um, you know, my behavior and what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. Um, at at self-authoring, what I can take as object are my relationships, um, you know, my part in things and um, self-transforming, you know, it's pretty much, I can take as object all of that previous stuff <laughs> yeah yeah even myself it, it, self transforming yes. yes so in a way i think what you're saying is being the subject is almost what we have to by definition submit to in a way i mean it's the thing that's governing us right that we can't right. step away from Right. But but with the object, it's the thing we can separate ourselves from. So at yes. level three, I can separate myself from the things that uh, governed my reality at level two. At level yes. four, I can separate myself. And then at level five, I would be able to separate myself even in a way from myself, which is a funny sentence to say. Well, yes, from my definition of myself. From my definition of myself. Right. But, but the process that I see myself going through that I'm still subject to that's what's driving me. Oh, gosh. Okay. Like those are the eyes through which I see, you know, I can't see my own eyes. But yeah, so it gets so abstract there that I, I feel like I mean, it, you know, it's so sort of tantalizing. And it's also so abstract that, that, uh, you know, at some point, I feel like it, well, it does matter, because we're all, you know, sort of, that's the, you know, one of the things that I don't know if Bob mentioned this to you when you talked to him, but one of the um, things that he has said in some of the recent talks I've heard is that no, at no time in the history of this, of humanity, have we, you know, grown this old, so that we had the opportunity to keep transforming. Yes. And so, you know, so that's, you know, that's who we are as humans. It's like, that's what we do. It's, there's this, there's this motion of wanting to keep growing, of wanting to understand more, you know, as soon as I understand something, it's like, well, there's something new to understand, you know, and I think that's one of the things that gets me so excited about working with this theory is, you know, when you have kids, you can see when they're growing, they get so excited, like, look, mommy, look, daddy, I can reach this, you know, and they're just so exuberant, and they want to, you know, so you can see that. And, you know, as we grow old, it's like we lose some of that enthusiasm, we don't like, you know, we don't turn to our partner and say, look, I understand this now. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I see what I'm subject to, you know, we don't do that to outwardly. But <laughs> <laughs> but there's still something. maybe in your maybe in your house and my house we do but I bet most of America that doesn't actually happen in. right <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but you know I mean what I have said it, it feels good to grow you know this is one of the things that that when I work with with a, one of my coaching clients and you know they it's I call it a log jam you know they come up against something and it's just like they can't understand they can't see it and somehow you know 
through my incredible genius, <laughs> I help them, or you know, or they, or whatever, find a way to kind of remove one. I mean, they get a perspective on it, and the log jam breaks. Yeah. And they see what they could not see before. Uh, and it's such an amazing moment. I can hear, I mean, I do most of my work over Zoom or over the phone. You can hear it in their voice. Their entire voice just, it just drops. Not, not in a bad way, but into a more grounded place. And they just, and, you know, it just feels so good. So, uh, I know you know, exactly and I see this you're... with my son when he finally, you know, kind of gets through something and sees it from a diff from a bigger perspective there's just there's like a relief there's a exuberance that you know as adults when we're like you know you know we don't talk about that but we feel it yeah uh it's so beautiful can you turn this into you and i talked a little bit about the order of the interview but um yeah what what keeps us from having those steps of growth like like this yeah. is the growing as grown-ups podcast i think the reason i don't know but i think the reason most of our audience listens is because they are interested in growing themselves so yeah what are yeah. some of like the what are some of the inhibitors to to growth at at each of these stages and you don't need to go into huge depth if there's some yeah. overarching things but then also if you want to tie it to it um what are some of the things that we can actually do, take responsibility for, engage in to br break the log jam in a way? Yeah. Well, I think that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of fear, you know, fear of, of, well, I think each mindset, each level has its own set of fears. Right. You know, at the interpersonal stage is fear of losing relationship, fear of losing the connection. Yeah. Um, you know, if I do something that makes, you know, my partner or my best friend mad at me, then I, then they might just go away. Um, so, and then, you know, the fear of someone at a full self-authoring is more about losing my sense of integrity. Like if I do something, I'm not, I'm, I'm not right with myself. You know, I feel like I'm, you know, it's just not right. I feel very unsettled in myself. Um, I'm not going to talk about the transforming because that's way too complicated right now. But, yeah. Um, so, so your question was what, what makes us stuck? What? Yeah. yeah. I mean, st stuckness, um, the th what holds us in place? What holds us in on the place. journey yeah. because you and I both have spent, I think, most of our adult lives measuring people who got to a place on the journey and 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 then they kind of stayed in that space. And one of the things that we've always mm, put forward, I suppose, is that is that um, the longer we stay in a place without growing, the more it impacts life satisfaction, well-being, effectiveness, mm -hmm. influence with others, um, yeah. things like yeah. that? Well, I think that, you know, it's a different, obviously, at every level and, and the transitions between, but I, I think, you know, for, for someone in the, in the socializing mindset, um, which is level three, which is level three, um, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's fear of fear of loss of relationship, fear of being ostracized. So, you know, and, and there's so many factors that might play into it. Most of which I think is the environments that we find ourselves in. Bob Keegan calls it, um, holding environments, which he got from Winnicott, you know, who, who said there's, you know, and actually this is really important. Winnicott said, there's never just a baby. There's always the baby and the mother, the dyad, because a baby cannot exist without the mother, the caretaker. Mm -hmm. So that's the holding environment. So that's the zero. holding environment, right? Like, like it's the, it's the social environment within which we find and know ourselves. So, so we all have a lot of different holding environments. There's, you know, our, our faith community, there's our family, our immediate family, there's our extended family, there's our, our work family, you know, there's our political party, 
There's, you know, maybe our, the sports team that we're part of. So there's all of these different um, social groups that we are part of, and they each have different pushes and pulls on us. Some of them may be more oppressive and hold us back from growing. Some of them may, you know, kind of pull us forward. So, mm-hmm. you know, one mm-hmm. of the things that keeps that. us stuck is being in an environment that does not encourage, if, if, if you're in, a, in the socializing mindset or level three, um, being in an environment or a social group that does not encourage you to kind of think for yourself. So politically, to step into some dangerous waters here, I think that you know part of the part of the uh, you know just the polarization that happens is that some sometimes you're in part of a group that if you start to question what the group is saying, then you're ostracized. You can't be part of that group if you question it. And depending on how important it is for you to belong to that group, then you're going to comply. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some seems people to ex- seems to be a pretty good explanation for uh, what Congress looks like right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's you know you you separate into these camps. I belong to this camp, so anything that you say or do because you belong to this camp is I'm going to just outright reject it. Even if you say exactly what I'm saying, because you're saying it here, I'm going to reject it because I can only be loyal to one um, group at a time. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? I'll keep going, Nancy. I'm sorry. I could tell you. Yeah. About, so at, so, at so some... I think that that is one of the biggest impediments in the three to four transition Right. is that sense of if I you know, if, if I start to question the authority of whoever is, you know, kind of running this show, I risk being ostracized or abandoned or, you know, it's being disloyal. So there's that fear. And it's a real fear because I, I know myself within that, that sphere of that, you know, of that group. And and if I am ostracized, it feels like I am literally being ripped apart. Wow. Yeah. So, 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 so let's, let's, st- I think, I think the majority of our listeners are at some point in the transition from three to four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if yep. they're, and if they're fully four, they'll make, they'll get the point of application. So yeah. if I am in between three and four, which is where mm-hmm. I bet a lot of your coaching clients are, I want to yes. shift gears to that in just a yes. second. How do you encourage people to let go? Be, and if I could just go for one second here and then yeah. let you go. Um, yeah. Is, that, <laughs> is um, it is so we find appropriately and beautifully such comfort and and purpose and and meaning when we become level three by these affiliations it's it's the normal as a matter of fact if we couldn't actually become four if we weren't three first because there's nothing to let go of exactly but but so i'm just echoing i guess what you're saying about man what you're letting go of what you fear being ostracized from is it is like um totally analogous to the losing your mother as a, mm-hmm. as an infant, mm-hmm. right. Or, yes. or, or your yes. primary caretaker. So, so back to three and four now. So what, so what, what can we do? How can we, what, how do you talk about that? Well, you know, again, it depends on where in the transition you are, but, but generally, I mean, if you're somewhere in the middle, you've got a little bit of self-authoring running at the same time that you have the socializing running. So you've got both things happening at the same time. There's one part of you that is saying, you know, I have to remain loyal to these people. I can't let them down. I can't hurt them. It kills me to know that I've let down these people that I care about and respect, you know, Mm -hmm. so I can't do that. And on the other hand, I have to go out and find my own life. I have to, you know, so so I, so the part of me can see myself separate from these people that I love and admire and feel loyal to. And another part of me is still 
you know, sort of loyal to, I, <laughs> I have another metaphor, which is of a cereal bowl for this transition exactly, which is, you know, you're, you're in a cereal bowl with a bunch of other Cheerios, you know, and that's level three, you're being held within this bowl and you're, you know, you're just like all the other Cheerios, you're all Cheerios, you're all in the bowl, you're all in the milk, and you're all, you know, getting along fine as long as nobody, you know, throws in a like a, you know, some Wheaties or something. <laughs> so, you know, when you're when in and the the first level of that transition is, you know, you're swimming around in this cereal bowl and you bump up against the edge of the bowl. So it's like you you start to feel the limitations of that holding environment. And so so the next thing, you know, then then when you get a little bit beyond that, then, you know, it's sort of like, then you get one leg out of the cereal bowl, but the other leg is still in the cereal bowl and, you're, and your balance is still inside the bowl. So you're still, you know, like defined by and held within those, you know, within the Cheerios, but there's, you know, this other part of you that's outside and that can see, oh yeah, there's a bowl that I'm held in but there's a whole other world out here that I can see that I want to go explore that, you know, I want to be separate from this, but I'm still, you know, my balance is still in there. I'm still loyal. I can't, you know, the other Cheerios still have my leg, <laughs> you know, and then the balance shifts so that you get more balance on the outside. And then, you know, when you can become fully self-authoring, then, you know, you're outside of the cereal bowl. Huh. The cereal bowl never loses the importance to you, but you're separate from it and you can relate to it rather than only knowing yourself within it. Are you still a Cheerio or does the metaphor break down at that part? Um, you could still be a Cheerio, I suppose, but you yes, could be something you, completely different. Yes, or you could, yeah, you could become, you know, like a honey nut Cheerio instead of just a plain Cheerio. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's a Let danger me, uh, of extending okay. this too far, but <laughs> I, I, kn I knew time was going to fly with you, and in fact, it has. So, oh so goodness, let's talk. Let, let's talk a little bit about um, a, a lot of your world right now is yes. um, coaching, coaching people. I'm guessing largely business people. I don't know if you do much life coaching kind of stuff in the middle of that. Yeah. But also you, but also you coach coaches yes. and, and, um, and, and train them in, in subject object interview, SOI technique and, and, yes. and things like that. Um, I, so, so get, give us a little bit about kind of, kind of what you do in that world. Um, you know, a lot of the people who listen to this podcast are leading others. Mm -hmm. So is there something that they could be thinking about as they have developmental influence with people who are following them, whether it's their children or whether it's employees or, 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 or even a, a group of friends that you're talking through an issue with, mm -hmm. right? I bet there's yeah. some points of application yeah. here. So what are yeah. some of your favorite techniques or, or things that, that you, know, you think might be important for our listeners to ponder? Yeah, well, I think I wouldn't call it a technique so much, but one of the things that I think is is critically important is you don't have to understand every single stage and every single transition, but but to know and to really get it that people make sense of things in very different ways. Hmm. And so when someone that you're leading or trying to have a relationship with or or working with um if, if you're having sort of an impasse, you know, I think some of us try to convince the other person or try to help them see it the way we see it. I think more important than that is to get curious about how they are seeing it and what's important to them in the situation. Because one of the things that I have learned, I feel like I'm- <laughs> You're not. All kinds of different directions. But one of the things that I have learned in all the years I've been doing this is that when people feel understood, they are much more likely to kind of, you know, follow, not follow, but, but they, lose, they lose a lot of their defensiveness. 
that if you if you're talk if you're working with someone and you say no it has to be this way and even in a gentle way people you know they kind of like get defensive and they back up and they say don't you tell me you know what to think how to feel what to do when when you when people feel like okay this they understand me they understand what's important to me and why it's important to me all of that defensiveness goes away and then i'm open to to hearing something else Mm. But, but if a person feels like they're just not like they're, I mean, and this is one of the things that takes me back to why this theory is so important to me is that if they don't feel like their experience matters to you, then they are not going to be cooperative. I mean, they may do what you tell them because they have to maybe, but they're not going to, they're not going to be fully on board. And that's one of the things when I, in the first the first class that I took, I mean, the first meeting of the first class I took with Bob when I was in graduate school, he talked about that this theory was about letting people know that their experience matters. It was about understanding them, about standing under, and he was, you know, like standing up on the, on the, uh, near the podium and just, you know, like pretending like he was holding a baby and saying, you have to hold this person. Let them know that you understand them, that their experience matters. And that has been sort of the touchstone for me, you know, for 35 years in working with this is that that is, that's the first step. Mm. I almost got choked up hearing well, you talk about that. I mean, that's a, that is a, such a beautiful image um and 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 what a takeaway you, you folks may not do that perfectly at first but right. if that was their mindset my yes. guess is is that most people would figure out how to get better and better at it and there's probably yeah. some fear that they would be bumping up against yes. to even say yes well if i do that will they take advantage of me if i do that will they quit performing if i do that will they not grow up well you know, so there you are, you're, you're letting go of some control as the coach to say, I'm going to embrace your understanding. Yes. Oops. And keep I, going. I, yeah. I think there's a way to, you know, as a coach to, to ask questions, to inquire, to be curious without, you know, sort of giving over the control. It's not so much about that, but about, you know, tell me what this means to you. Tell me more, yeah. you know? what's hardest for you about and you know these are all subject object interview questions that help to get at how people make sense of things so when you can understand how people make sense of things what they cannot take a perspective on and what they feel like i they're identified or defined by yeah then then you can sort of adjust your expectations you know, it's all in that the book that Bob wrote about in over our heads that we expect people to be fully self authoring and they're not. So, you know, so for someone who has a hard time feeling like they can put out their own opinion in the presence of an authority. You know, to know that maybe helps you to say, well, you know, I'd like to hear your opinion. You know, I'm giving you permission to tell you what you think. Tell me what you think. Yeah. And that can help, you know, sort of open that door. But I really, I mean, there's all kinds of, of, you know, of questions that you can ask, but I think that it's a general sense of curiosity and inquiry about, you know, tell me more and how can I support you in that? Mm, that is so, that is so good. Um, I, we would, um, we'll see if we can make this work, but I would, I would love to have you back. I would love to uh, invite Sarah and I'd love to go down the road you just started on a little bit. How do we Great. start to understand that? But, but I would also, I mean, like what's making your world go around right now? What is it? Is it mostly coaching and coaching coaches? Yeah. And if so, are you open? Would you is it okay if people reach out to you if they're Absolutely. if they're interested? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have um, a couple of colleagues in Amsterdam and we're working together. We uh, we have a okay. curriculum for- Like in Amsterdam overseas? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. And you're in yeah. Boston or Ipswich, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, for the magic of Zoom, it works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have a curriculum for teaching people how to do, how to, you know, assess and um, conduct the subject object interview so they can, you know, understand their, where their clients are, you know, making sense along this continuum. The thing that I'm really excited about is that we are kind of expanding this to have a, a kind of a practicum or a supervisory thing where, where we will actually be, um, you know, kind of coaching coaches in how to use the subject object interview in their practice. So, um, so we'll have people, the participants will bring in, you know, a, an interview from a client and we'll go through it and sort of, you know, supervise their SOI <laughs> coaching. Um, How, so, What's the best way for people to get in, in, in touch with you? Um, let's see, I either LinkedIn, uh -huh. I'm on LinkedIn or- and just Nancy, just Nancy Pop? Yeah. Or, yeah, I, I don't know. I think there's there are a few. Well, don't, yeah, we'll figure it out. And we'll put it in the show notes. So folks, go to yeah, the yeah. show notes if you yeah. want to get in touch with Nancy. Yeah. Yeah, and also um, my email with my colleagues uh, in Amsterdam is nancy at halgrencoaching.com. H a l g r e n c o a c h i n g dot com. Very good. So um, I knew this love time to hear was going to. I knew this time was going to fly, and it did. Uh, it did for for me. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for giving your time, for sharing your wisdom, for sharing your beautiful visual images. <laughs> I mean, I had not heard any of them. The punching bag, the Cheerios, the whole thing. It that big takeaways for me. So way to go. That's great. Well. It was really fun. I, I, I feel like I'm all ready to talk for another hour. So we'll have to do it again. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that conversation between Keith and Nancy. Normally, at this point in the podcast, the one of us who did not do the interview would share our big takeaways from the conversation. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it on you. <laughs> you are without warning. Without warning. She's gonna turn it on me without warning. You, yeah, you like you like surprises, yeah. right? So you you and Nancy have been studying this and working in this and living this for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I want to know before I share what I learned from Nancy. Wow. If there was something that you learned new mm. from your conversation with her that shed light on what you uh yeah. what you were thinking beforehand yeah thanks for no warning on this question <laughs> um yeah i mean there were a number of things that i think she brought to bear that um were really fun um i i think i had i, I think the thing that i fell in love with most the thing that kind of stuck with me after the interview because we did this a, a couple of weeks ago um is this idea of a center of gravity, okay. right? And that, and that um, we've talked on different episodes, even on the Growing as Grownups podcast, we've talked about, you know, the, the, we have multiple spaces around where we actually measure showing up in our lives. And the easiest way to think about that is I can think I'm kind of level four, kind of self-authored. And then all of a sudden this thing bugs me from the other side. Mm -hmm. And then but at my best, I feel like I'm jumping forward. And the idea of the of the punching bag of the you know of the weevils wobble, the but weevils, they don't fall down. Weevils wobble, but they don't <laughs> fall down. That that the, where we are developmentally is that center of gravity. Mm -hmm. But as circumstances either blow us forward, push us back, as they punch us in the face, whatever they do, <laughs> there is this movement around that center of gravity. But ultimately, as the dust settles, we set, we settle back. Mm -hmm. Right. And I thought that that was a, a really um, 
it's uh, it's just stuck with me as a metaphor and stuck with me in thinking about so many people who ask, yeah, but I feel like I can be all the levels at the same time and all of that kind of stuff, that that was a, a great explanation of that. And then I may hold off. I think the other thing that I have talked to others about since this, so I know that it had a big impact, was Nancy's conceptualization of like the purest, fullest version of level five. I, I think what's become true to her over time is it's something that we can't even fully get our arms around, right? And mm -hmm. so it's hard to even talk about it. And it was interesting having her use the the metaphor of of water that is the is like the it uh, water doesn't lose its waterness, its its sense of being water. The molecules are still together, but the movement and the flexibility and the openness and the all of that. So, mm -hmm. so there's two big things. Did you want it to go there that deep, that early? No, that, that was great. Okay. I mean, I, I just could hear in your voice in, in kind of your response to what she was saying, this like, Ooh, like this sense <laughs> of new understanding. And so um, I think it's a treat to get you to watch you go through that. I mean, the same a little bit with your conversation with Dr. Keegan, but you know, one thing that struck me and I don't, I don't want to spend time talking about because the point is, I feel more convinced now that I don't know how to talk about level five of like, man, like I don't even know how to describe it. So I'm, I'm sure I'm not it. I don't think I know anybody who's it, but it, the fact that it's not a concrete destination that yeah. someone can get to shows that we all just continue to evolve. And, and she talked about that. I think she was even referencing, um, Bob Keegan when she talked about it but just the job of being human is to continue to grow and mm. and um our job is to witness the the excitement of growth and to help people have those kind of eye-opening moments of breaking the log jam and, and mm -hmm. taking that next step, step forward and I thought that was great um I love that that she she talked about some of the things that we've talked about before, but just using different language. Like it always helps, you know, they, our audience has heard us talk about it. Then right. we had Ryan, Bob, mm -hmm. now yep. Nancy, we'll have Carl on um, soon, but different language, different metaphors. And, and just this idea that she talked about the, the holding environment. Mm. And Bob talked a little bit about the social contracts and all these things that talk that, that point to the, the risk and the fear that comes with growth. I keep thinking about that from Bob's interview and she brought it up again, that it's like, especially for people who are level three dominant or even just- You yeah, still have a lot on, of threeness hanging on, right? Like what, what am I risking losing by going against what the other groups are telling me? What my, um, you know, can I still belong to this group if I- separate myself from them mm. in some way and just this idea of again being sensitive to the loss and the death that comes with growth mm. right um i thought was something yeah totally totally amazing and that you know um the holding environment makes a ton of sense to me early in our early in our journeys through mm -hmm. childhood through our teenage years mm -hmm. into our 20s kind of into the full threeness of our lives right mm -hmm. it's like it's like the holding environment really makes sense but the it's it's interesting when we self-author our own holding environment based on all the things that led up to that point in our lives and and um i don't think the fear lessens i think the fear actually grows because it's like what if i lose my sense of yeah. self it's one thing to feel like well, what if this group kind of disowns me? Or what if this ideology or this perspective no longer has me be a part of them? I think people get to a point in their lives where they go, yeah, that's, the, that's a risk I'm willing to take. Mm -hmm. It is so much scarier <laughs> to bump up against the holding environment at level four, because it's like, what if I lose my sense of self? And yet there is a... Um, you never get to... I don't know if this will even be meaningful to people, but you never get to become the ocean. Right. I, I don't, I, I haven't thought through this metaphor enough, but, but just playing off of Nancy's idea that, that we've got this self-authored container. It's like, it's like a thing that holds us. Right. 
and that level five creates an openness that integrates all of the complexity and motion of the world in an even truer, deeper way. And But mm -hmm. we don't get to experience it that if we're not willing to let go of the holding environment, at least enough to experiment in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other thing that she said was, was at the end, and it echoes what we've talked about so many times, was her advice on what she shares with people about how to grow and how to help others grow mm -hmm. is just, again, back to this empathy and this curiosity and this understanding that everybody makes sense of things differently. Yeah. And, and our role is to understand where each person is coming from as much as we can, to be curious about them and not assuming that they make sense of things the way that that we do not judging them for the fact that what they're doing doesn't make sense against our mm. way of being yeah but to say how do i make you feel understood yeah and how do i understand you as deeply as i can and i just think you know i said it before like how better would our world be if we could all just do more of that totally totally and that is that was thematic through Dr. Keegan's interview. It was thematic in Nancy's interview. I just loved the pragmatic advice to people who are leading or have influence with others, with their children, with their friends, with their partners, spouses, whatever, is that there is a mindset, a coaching mindset that doesn't take like this expert learning of all these coaching techniques. And you've talked about the mindset around design thinking. You've talked about mindsets around a lot of things, but getting yourself in a position where you want to let other people know that their experience matters. Mm -hmm. And I, and I love that. You th I think about that with my adult children. I think about that with my youngest child. I think about that with your middle schoolers reflecting back on my middle schoolers or high schoolers. Now I'm sorry, kids. Um, <laughs> But this idea that your experience matters to me puts you in a different posture. It puts you in a more curious space. It puts you in a, what you think about the world is important to me. Mm -hmm. And and the thing that we know as coaches, because we've gotten to experience it, is, is someone can be at a, at a different and earlier level than you. And when they are able to share their experience, that will also change you where you are. It brings a new level of understanding to you about not only maybe how the, the, the world works for them, but, but maybe understanding in a new way how the world even works. Because yeah, it of gives that. you a glimpse that you couldn't have seen unless through somebody else's eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfectly said, perfectly said. Um, so anyway, folks, I had to, anything else from you? No, those are my big things. Yeah. So um, we hope you enjoyed the podcast as much as I know I did. <laughs> but there was a little bit, I know there was a little bit of geeking out, but I, I hope that was, a, I, I hope there were some things that were said that really connect with you all in a way that you can apply not only to grow yourself, but to grow those around you. So thanks for being with Ooh, us. I do have one more thing now okay, that you've just said the conclusion. For those of you that have stuck with us to the end, I want to just remind everybody, it's been a long time since we reminded people that we have resources on our website. If if this vertical development journey yeah. is something that you want to invest in um, for yourself, we have the, the growth gap tool is on the website um, for free. The listening to lead self on the shelf tool is online for free that helps you and facilitate those conversations. And then we've got some online courses if you want to go deeper on listening on with yourself full, or with your team, mm -hmm, yeah. full development journey. Um, check those out. If you've made it this long, it means you're interested and we, we want to equip you with all the resources we can. Thanks for bringing that up, Sarah. Growinggrownups.com. Yes. All right, folks. We'll Thank see you. you so much for joining us for another episode of Growing as Grownups. Take a second and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes and tell your friends. You'll find all of the goods related to this episode, including the transcript, videos, links, and other ways we can help you keep growing as a grown-up on our website, growinggrownups.com. Growth isn't easy, but it's completely within your reach. Until next time, journey well, friends.